Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening in the Lord's house. Uh, I thank you for uh, having me, for entertaining me uh, this evening and uh, last night uh, in worship together. Uh, and tonight, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Zechariah chapter 6. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6 t- tonight. For those of you um, wondering and maybe wanting to follow along word for word uh, with me, I'll be reading from the King James Version. So if you have your phone and you uh, pull it out to read word for word, I won't uh, hold that against you. So, all right. So Zechariah chapter 6 tonight. And before we read our passage, uh, I'd just like to say, just as Brother Brandon said uh, earlier, that uh, Brandon has been a good friend to me. He's been a good encouragement uh, to me uh, for a little while now. And I just again like to thank you all for uh, your pastor, for a g- the good friend that he's been to me. So if you have your Bibles in Zechariah 6, we'll just begin by reading the Word of God together in verse 9. The Scripture says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Hildai, of Tobijah, and of Jediah, which are from, come from Babylon. And come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And now together, let's go before our Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you. Lord, we just thank you for your everlasting mercies towards us in Jesus Christ. Lord, that it him who builds his house, Lord, who bears all the glory of it, and Lord, that we benefit, we only benefit from that glory which he bears. Lord, we ask tonight that you would stir up in us a remembrance, Lord, of his glory. Lord, that you'd help us to know how we ought to live in his sight from this day forth. And Lord, we ask that if it be your will, Lord, that you would stir up true religion in our area. Lord, that you would start in our own hearts, Lord, to turn us towards our great Savior, Jesus, Lord, to serve and to worship him and to trust in him in a right way. Lord, we pray that you would uh, be with all of your people at this time, be with us tonight, and help us to understand your word, open our hearts to it, and not only to dryly understand it, uh, Lord, but to apply it to our lives. And Lord, we just pray that in all things you would be glorified in what we do tonight. And it's in your holy Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So here we have one of my favorite passages in all the Scripture. And I'd like us to see, since it's about the building of the temple of the Lord, what it has to do with revival. What it has to do with what we are asking of God after tonight. But first, we have to understand what the text means. It's, it, the, the text is steeped in symbolic language. It's steeped in uh, language that's not perfectly plain to us. So we have to understand first what the passage is saying. And so in verse 12, I'd first like to ask, who is this man called the branch? In verse 12, it says, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. Though this passage here is talking about Joshua. Joshua was the high priest in those days. He was the heir of the high priest's office. Uh, And he was speaking to Joshua when, when he was saying this. Yet, Joshua in the book of Zechariah is a type for Jesus Christ. In fact, the name Joshua and the name Jesus are really the same name. One is just written in Greek, and one is written in Hebrew. And here we even have another prophecy in the Scripture that references this branch. In in, uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, the Scripture says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. 
And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. This passage, which is obviously about Jesus Christ, the root of Jesse, the son of David, obviously here when the Lord says, Behold the man whose name is the branch. The branch. It's talking symbolically about Jesus Christ. Zechariah 3 also tells us more about this branch. And it tells us that he's connected with the forgiveness of sins. In Zechariah 3 and verse 8, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the engraving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. The branch, it says, at His coming, when the branch comes, when the Father sends Him into the world, it says in one day, the Lord will remove the iniquity of the land. In one day. This is obviously when Christ died on the cross for our sins and removed our iniquity from us. Not only that, but he talks about the cornerstone there. Uh, he says, for behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. They were building the temple at that time. They, they were constructing it. And the Lord, he says, that He will lay the cornerstone. As the New Testament says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. So the branch is obviously a prophecy about Jesus Christ. That the Lord would send His only begotten Son to save His people. And so what then does the temple mean? We're asking right now, what does the passage mean? What, what, are, what, what are all the elements of the passage and what do they mean? First, we see about the temple that this is what Christ builds. In verse 12, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whom, whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. The, the temple of the Lord is what Christ builds. And this is the church that Jesus builds. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, or 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, the scripture says, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Uh, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be My people. The, he says we are the temple of the living God. The church. Because the Holy Ghost dwells in us. Because, because God walks among us. We are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 also says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Just as the Spirit of God came down on the tabernacle in the Old Testament when they were wandering in the wilderness. When He came down as a pillar of, uh, of, of a cloud and a pillar of fire by night, and He dwelt on the tabernacle, and later when Solomon dedicated the temple, when the Holy Ghost was sent into the temple and dwelled in it, so He says, we are the temple of the living God. That He dwells with us. And so what we have in our passage so far is that Christ will be sent. And what Christ will do is build a church. He will build His temple. And so how does He build it? And this is what I'd like to spend the rest of our time looking at. How does Christ build His church? In fact, I think that's the whole point. The, the whole desire of having revival. Of, of gathering together and, and listening to the Word of God preached and praying, and, and, and singing these songs together, the whole point of that is to ask how it is that the church is built up, and to pray that God would do it. And so, 
How is it that Christ builds His church in our passage? Verse 13 says to us, Even He shall build the temple of the Lord, and He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon His throne, and He shall be a priest upon His throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. There's some odd things that are mentioned here in the passage, and not the least of which is the council of peace. To understand how Christ builds His church, we have to know what this council of peace means. This phrase is a biblical name for a concept that pastors and preachers sometimes talk about called the covenant of redemption. The council of peace. A covenant or a council here in our passage is a kind of an agreement or a contract. It's, it's what the, the ancients called a, a, a contract or, or a kind of agreement. Where you have two or more parties, you have two people, and they agree together to do something. They put requirements on one another to fulfill this contract. And it's not much different than the contracts that we make today. If, if, if I say that I'll lend say you so much money, I'll give you so much money in order to, to go into a business venture, and I require, it, say, in return from you, that you'll pay uh, so much percentage of your profit for so long. That's just a simple kind of covenant that we have among ourselves. There's a requirement on me that I put forward the money, and there's a requirement on you that you make a profit and return a little to me. There are also some other kinds of covenants that are unilateral, and we're not talking about those tonight. Which Those are more like a promise. But here we're talking about an agreement that was made between two or more persons. And the covenant of redemption is the agreement that's existed between the persons of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost from all eternity. It's an agreement that they made before the world began. And it has to do with creation, with the, the, the events of history, and eventually with the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. It's the agreement that they made among themselves. So let's look at this agreement since our passage mentions it. First, we see that the Father promised to give the Son a people. God the Father promised to Jesus Christ that He would give Him an inheritance. That He would give Him a holy nation. In Psalm 2 and verse 7, we have a little window into this covenant that was made. It says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Christ is speaking, the Lord has said to me, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten Thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. The Father says to the Son Jesus, I will give you the farthest parts of the earth. I'll give you everything in the world, even, even to the furthest nation away from Israel. Even to the furthest speck of dust in the universe. It's yours for your enjoyment. This promise was made again from the Father to the Son before the world began. And this promise concerns the church. He says, ask of Me, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. I'll give you people. Not just Israel. Not just the, the, the Jews. But also the Gentiles. Also from every nation of the world. I'll give to you a people, the Father says to the Son. This is, of course, the church that's mentioned again. That temple that we're talking about that Jesus is building. In John 17.24, Father, Christ says, Father, I will that they also whom Thou hast given Me be with Me where I am, that they may behold My glory which Thou hast given Me. For Thou lovest Me before the foundation of the world. The, the Son prays to the Father that He would keep the people that are given to Him. That the people that are, are given to Him would be where, they, where He is. 
would, would always be with Him. Just as He says at the end of Matthew. He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. That's the desire of Jesus Christ. And the reason that He gets it is because Thou lovest Me before the foundation of the world. Because the Father loved the Son and has given all things into His hands. So, the Father, in His part of the covenant, is to give Jesus Christ a people. But there are also conditions laid on the Son. The condition that the Father promises is He'll give the people. But the condition laid on Jesus is that He be found worthy of the people and that He save the people. Christ must show Himself worthy. Christ must uphold the covenant. If the covenant is to be fulfilled, Christ must fulfill it. Christ showed to us His worthiness in His life. He showed us His obedience to the Father. Never once did Jesus ever disobey the Father. Never once did He break the commandments. Always He did the things that pleased His Father. Psalm 40 and verse 7 speaks in prophecy about Jesus. And it says, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of Me. I delight to do Thy will, O my God. Yea, Thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, Thou knowest. I have not hid Thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared Thy faithfulness and Thy salvation. I have not concealed Thy loving kindness and Thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not Thou Thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let Thy loving kindness and Thy truth continually preserve me. How many times did Jesus there say, I have. I have done this. I have completed this work. I have delighted to do Your will. And at the end, Christ says, Withhold not Thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let Thy loving kindness and Thy truth continually preserve me. Because Jesus lived up to the standards of God the Father. Because He never disobeyed God the Father. He was worthy to receive the promise. But not only was He worthy because He kept the will of the Father, but because He saved the people that was given to Him to save. Because He died on the cross. In Isaiah 53.10, we have another mention of this agreement. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for He shall bear their iniquities. He saved us. Therefore will I divide Him a portion with the great. And He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because He hath poured out His soul unto death. And He was numbered with the transgressors. And He bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus, when He died on the cross, earned us for Himself. And He saved us for Himself. So didn't you know that the establishment of the church, that the establishment of the believers who worship here with you all, that that was accomplished in Jesus Christ. That Jesus died on the cross in order to get this as His reward. To get you who believe tonight, who have sung His praises as His reward reward. Not for anything we've done. Not because we're worth anything. But because He is worthy of us. Because He is is wonderful. And He kept the promise of God. And so, this is how the church is established. And how is it then that Christ builds His church on this covenant? On this promise that was made to Him? First, we see that He builds the church by His own glory. By His own self. 
Again in verse 13 of Zechariah 6, the Scripture says, Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Christ must get all the glory out of building the church. Christ will get all the glory out of building the church. His is the greatest weight of glory in the world. Because He's the only one worthy. Because because He's the one that died for the church. He's the one that obeyed for the church. He's the one that was incarnate for the church. The church was promised to Him before the foundation of the world. Because He will not have anyone else to boast in the church also. No one else can be allowed to have glory in the foundation of His church. In Galatians 6.4 it says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. God forbid that even the Apostle Paul should boast in himself. God forbid that anyone take any ounce of glory away from Jesus Christ for its founding. 1 Corinthians 3.5, Paul again says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. He says, who, who is Paul? Who's Apollos? Except the one that the Lord gave. Except the one that the Lord founded. And he continues, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Jesus must exclusively build His church. He must exclusively be the foundation of His church. Otherwise, Paul is something. Apollos is something. Otherwise, we might boast. We were the ones that built the church. I was the one that built Open Door Baptist Church. I was the one that, that, that did this or that. But the Scripture will have none of that. Christ must have all the glory in the building of His church. And so therefore, since it's established by His power, the church continues and grows by His power to keep it. First, He keeps it from falling apart. In Lamentations 3.22 we read, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. And I believe that that was the passage on this uh, revival's um, uh, flyer that that, uh, Brother Brandon put on. But it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. It's the Lord's uh, doing. It's, it's, it's His glory that He's kept the church all these years until now. It's, it's, it's to His praise that the church didn't fall in the first century. Or that the church didn't fall in the Diocletian persecution. Or that the church didn't fall at the Reformation. Or that the church didn't fall in the Enlightenment. Or that the church has lived until today. That you all have been here as a congregation for close to 200 years now is a testament to Christ's keeping power. It is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. He's also the one who expands the church. In Acts 2 and verse 46 to 47, it says, They, the believers, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. They, they continued to worship. They continued to be faithful. They continued to be the church. And it says, The Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord is the one that expands the church. The Lord is the one that adds new believers into His church. It's not grown by any of us any more than it's established by any of us. 
Christ established the church. He has kept the church. And He is the one that grows the church also. And so, I'd like to bring it to some very pointed application tonight. Beloved, first we can take comfort in the fact that Christ establishes His church. We can take comfort that it's His work, His obedience, His death on the cross that's established it. Even in the West here, as Christianity seems to be declining in America, it seems to be declining in all of the Western nations, we can still take comfort that Christ has established His church. Do you trust that the sacrifice of Christ is enough to save you? Do you trust as I do that Christ will save to the uttermost all those that come unto God by Him? Then also believe that the church is established forever. That it cannot be moved. Because Christ died for the church. He died for the whole body of Christ. Every bit as much as He died for me. As He died for us individually. Matthew 6.18 therefore says, that Christ said, upon this rock I will build My church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the One who causes us to prosper. And so, it cannot fall. So if we have angst in our lives, if we are worried about the future, about our children, about whether they will have a church to return to in the future, then don't worry about it. Christ has established His church. And He will keep it by His power. Also, seeing that Christ is the One who builds His church. If we want church growth, if we want the church to be built up, if we want believers to be sent to us. We cannot neglect prayer. If we do not come to He who builds the church, the church will not be built. Even He shall build the temple of the Lord, and He shall bear the glory. In Matthew 7, verse 7, Christ says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Why do we ask? Why do we seek? Why do we knock? Because those answers are not found in ourselves. Because those things are found in Jesus Christ. We ask from Him. We knock at His door. We seek at His house. And He will give it in His own time. We have to ask God that He'll revive pure religion in our lands. Also, Let's continue in our own covenant obligations. You know, of course, that our Bibles are divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. Testament is just another word for covenant. It's just another word for a covenant, and specifically one that is established at the death of a testator. The death of someone who makes this covenant. And that is Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, Israel had covenant obligations. And in the New Testament, we also have covenant obligations. We have to continue in prayer. We have to continue in worship towards God. In reading the Scripture and having it expounded to us. We have to continue in caring for one another. As the New Testament says, to anoint one another's head with oil. Uh, As in, to to take care of one another when we're needy, when when we're sick and we need someone to, to look after us. We need to have love between each other. If we will not fulfill our covenant obligations, if we will not be a church that cares for its own, that continues faithfully in worship and in evangelism and in the other things that we're called to in the New Testament, then will Christ send His new believers to us? Will will, Will Christ establish our local congregation? It, it, it's, it's one thing to say, of course, that Christ builds the church by Himself. We don't contribute anything to that. But we can definitely disqualify ourselves from 
the Lord sending His dear, beloved children to us. We have to continue faithful in the form of worship that's laid out to us in the New Testament. Otherwise, the Lord will pass us over in His building of the church. Acts 2 and verse 41 through 47, if you'd like to read it later, outlines to us what the early church did. And at the very end, it says that they prayed, they broke bread, they worshiped, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. And at the end it says, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When they had done that, the Lord added to His church. And so believers, we see that Christ has established His covenant. Christ has a people promised to Him from the Father. He earned them in His obedience, His death on the cross, His resurrection, His ascension, and His mediating for His people in heaven. And we know that that promise cannot fall flat. Therefore, let's leave it in His hands. Let's just continue to do as He's asked us to do. To worship as He's asked us to worship. And pray that He will build His church in due time. Having faith that He'll do it. And now if there's an unbeliever here tonight, I never like to end any opportunity to speak without addressing if there's an unbeliever here. If you don't know what it means that Christ died on the cross for your sins, or if you know what it means, but you've not trusted in it, if you think that there's any little bit of your salvation, of your flourishing that's accomplished by you, then you are not Christ's. You are not established by His covenant. And I pray that you would come to trust in Jesus Christ tonight. That He would save you. There's no salvation in yourself. There's no salvation in anyone in the church. There's only salvation in Jesus who established the church. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You must be saved by Jesus Christ who died on the cross. And so come to Jesus and live. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into His hands. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you do not believe in him, if you do not trust in him, the wrath of God is still on you to this day. And I pray that you would come to Jesus Christ. Come to the one that is given all things. That's given the power to forgive your sins. You have sinned against him. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so you need His salvation. And I pray that you would come to Jesus and be saved. And again, believers, let's be encouraged tonight. Let's be encouraged to go about the work that Christ has given us to do, both here and at my church in Mayfield when I go home. And remember that Christ has established His church wherever it is. And just trust in Him to build it. Let's go evangelize. Let's go win our friends and family to the Lord. And let's be, uh, go before our Lord in a word of prayer now. Father God, we come before You and again we thank You. We thank You so much for that blessed covenant that You have given to Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank You for that Holy Ghost which has sealed the covenant to Him and to us. Lord, we pray that You would help us to be found worthy in our time of the covenant. Lord, not for our own works, but Lord, for the faith of Jesus Christ, we pray that You would establish us in it. Lord, we ask You would help us to proclaim Christ's righteousness to the world, that any who believe in Him can be saved. And Lord, we ask that uh, You would keep us safe to that end and bring us to the day of Christ whole. And it's in His holy name we pray. Amen.